Good evening. Welcome to Heritage Baptist Church. It's good to see you all tonight. Grab a songbook if you would. Turn to number 243. Number 243 in your songbooks. Let's stand together as we sing I Am Resolved. Number 243. Sing it out. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Good singing this evening. Take a minute and greet those around you. Alright, let's find a way back to our seats. We'll start again on verse number 3. Verse 3, page 243. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus. It felt like spring today. I actually rolled my window down on the way home because I couldn't get my car cool enough, and I realized <laughs> I had a temperature, and that wasn't, uh, that wasn't the issue. But what a nice day, and a good morning. I appreciate everybody that was here today and got to meet some of the guests from last Sunday. Uh, I don't know if you heard all the noise going on during handshaking time. Normally, we say, how you doing? Tom Gerber, he yells at people. But uh, Gatos just found out, going to have an addition to their family. Uh, Tammy is due in December, and uh, they're going to be grandparents. I cannot wait to call her grandma. That is going to be like the coolest thing in the world. But uh, we're excited for you, for John and Vanessa, and a uh, wonderful time. Nothing better than grandparents. You will forget these Yahoo sitting down in the front row. They'll mean nothing. 
It'll all be about little Tommy. Uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, several things to be praying for, if you would. Terry Spencer, as we mentioned today, has diverticulitis and a very painful uh, condition. Pray for her recovery. Uh, Vanna Gerber and Evelyn are flying home from India this week. Uh, they will be back in New York City sometime Wednesday. Is it Wednesday afternoon? And uh, so uh, just pray. That's a long trip for anybody, especially somebody that's... Uh, you know, about to give birth in a few weeks, and a two- or three-year-old. So uh, pray for their safety uh, for the trip. And, of course, we're praying for uh, Christy Mason's dad, Mr. Tom Clark, who had an above-the-knee amputation this week. Uh, pray for his full recovery uh, for that. And Catherine Peterman, uh, pastor's wife from Maine, uh, stage 4 carcinoma and uh, not doing well. Seems like going downhill rapidly, and it's all happened since February. So please be praying for these and, and others. A lot of sickness in the church. I, I mean, I've just got a cold, but there's some of the stomach thing going around. Um, Victoria Vargas was in the hospital the other night. I think Friday night they, they took her to Children's Hospital because she uh, was so sick and they got everything under control, sent her home yesterday. Uh, so let's just be praying. It's late in the season, but, but it's an interesting year. So uh, a lot of flus and colds. Uh, pray one for another. Let us pray. Father, thank you for a good day. Thank you for all you've done for us. And Lord, uh, many answers to prayer uh, today. And we're, we're glad for all of that. Uh, Lord, um, we pray for Vaughn and Evelyn as they fly home uh, in the middle of the week. Give them safety uh, as they travel our way. Bless our missions conference this week. Prepare our hearts for it. Lord, when a church does something uh, every year for decades, no matter how important it is, uh, there can almost be a tendency that we don't think it's important anymore. And Lord, may we never feel that way. And Lord, I pray this year, year your hand would be upon this conference as never before be the brother Morrison, and uh, I pray that he would be completely healed up from recent surgery as he comes to preach for us, give safety to all of our missionaries driving into town. Be with Terry as she's uh, resting, recovering at home from uh, the diverticulitis. Be with Mrs. Peterson, Peterman and her family and that church, and be with the, the preacher there as he takes care of his wife and his teenagers and a church and the Lord has no answers and uh, not sure what comes next, but they need your grace and your wisdom and your power. Lay your healing hand upon that precious lady. Lord, bless our service tonight. Thank you that we can have church on a Sunday night. Lord, I pray we'd learn and we'd apply everything we can. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Keep your songbooks out. Turn to number 451. Number 451. As we sing, the old account was settled. There was a time on earth when in the book of heaven an old account was standing for sins yet unforgiven. My name was at the top and many things below. I went unto the keeper and settled long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away When the old account was settled long ago The old account was large and growing every day For I was always sinning and never tried to pay But when I looked ahead and saw such pain and woe I said that I would settle, I settled long ago, long ago Long ago, yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. Let's sing that fourth verse as our last. When in that happy home, my Savior's home above, I'll sing redemption story and praise him for his love. I'll not forget that book with pages white as snow because I came and settled and settled long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. My leg just fell off. This is the only church in the world that anybody ever hears of the pastor. It just really did. That's annoying. 
But uh, I was preaching last Sunday in New Jersey at Solid Rock, and uh, I was kind of walking back and forth with an illustration uh, about Jairus and his journey from when he met Christ and all the way to the house and so forth. And uh, my, my knee is computerized. Uh, it reads my movements, so it anticipates what I'm going to be doing next so the knee functions properly. And um, I don't know what I did. I, I must have sent it a message, and it locked I was trying to take a step, and it, I mean, it locked. And when this thing locks, it's locked. And so I'm trying to take a step, and it wouldn't bend, and it threw me backwards. Uh, it's a Sunday morning church service. You know, there's like 800, 900 people in there and all that kind of stuff. And I think, oh, no, I'm going to be breakdancing in the middle of church. What's <laughs> uh, I caught myself real well. One most graceful movement, but uh, it's a journey. Somebody lost a bracelet outside. Uh, or somewhere this morning. Is that where you found it, Brother Tim? Uh, it looks like one of those Pandora deals. Anybody want to buy one? Okay. If you know whose it is, it's up here on the pulpit for you. Um, several things. Uh, today's the last day to sign up for the ladies' guided painting party. That'll be Saturday, April the 13th, but we need that number in uh, for the lady who's coming to uh, conduct the class. So ladies, if you have not signed up, Tonight is the chance. Tomorrow is the championship volleyball tournament, and we're looking forward to that. It's going to be a great time. Uh, a couple of uh, surprise things planned for tomorrow night that nobody's expecting, uh, so you want to be there. Uh, starts at 7 o'clock. Please be on time. Lots of, lots of spectators. I appreciate it this year. Uh, lots of great involvement. Uh, but that's, again, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Tuesday nights, I've been studying with the men on, uh, here at the church, but because of uh, preparations for missions conference, because we can't do them until Tuesday, uh, there'll be no men's Bible study this week, but we'll pick up again uh, next Tuesday. And then, of course, uh, Wednesday... I've been saying missions conference because I'm stuck on that after 21 years, but it's the World Missions Revival begins this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, our choir has got just some great music for us, a lot of special music through the week. Uh, some great missionaries and church planters are going to be a part. Of course, Brother Morrison is going to be here. He's always a blessed, great friend of our church and uh, looking forward to having him with us. Uh, it'll be every night, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at 7 o'clock. Now, we know, as we, we say this every year, uh, we know it's a school night, uh, but uh, you need to be here. We're usually done by 8.15, 8.20, 8.30 at the latest, and Brother Morrison's real good on time uh, on all of these things. Uh, and the truth of the matter is most of you, especially junior high, high school kids, they're not going to bed at 8 o'clock. You know they're not. Uh, and even some of your younger kids, they're not. Uh, better to have them a little tired on Thursday and Friday uh, and have them at missions conference in the evening so that God can speak to their heart and they can learn and get involved in things. Uh, so please be here. Please be a part of it. Uh, Saturday morning, we'll have our soul winning uh, at 10 o'clock. One of our missionaries, Ian Brown, is a church planner to Boston. Uh, Boston's one of uh, America's major cities, and it's one of the most unchurched cities in the nation. Yet God has been sending some young men uh, uh, to Boston to start churches. And Brother Brown has already started his church um, and uh, up and running. And God's doing some great things. He's actually going to speak at the uh, soul winning meeting uh, on Saturday morning. And so join us. Be a part of that. Uh, we have a, a bus promotion going on next Sunday. Brother Ben wanted us to know that Saturday, if you just want to come out and pass out some flyers, maybe stuff doors on Saturday in a bus route area, uh, uh, join us for that. But again, that's Saturday morning at 10. Then we also go out at 3.30 on Wednesday. Uh, weather is nicer. It's a good time to go. And uh, let me encourage you to be out as we get the gospel in our community. Uh, at 5 o'clock Saturday is the International Bank. We're going to eat at 5. So if you're bringing food, please have it here uh, a few minutes earlier. If you're not yet signed up, uh, please do so. And if you forget to sign up, that doesn't mean you can't come to the banquet. It just means you just have to stand and watch everybody else eat, but you can come. Uh, there's always going to be plenty of food. We, we want you to come. It's going to be a great time. Our, our Pats of the Pirate Club is going to do some music as well as other specials. Uh, Brother Morrison will speak. 
and uh, we always have fun at our banquet, so please be here as a part of that. A week from this coming Saturday, the uh, college and career singles uh, are going to go to the Quandary Escape Room in Wallingford. That's at 6 o'clock. Cost is $27 per person. Please see Brother Potter uh, by next Sunday if you plan to be a part of it. And then last but not least, Saturday, April the 13th, uh, Central Baptist Church in Southington uh, will be holding their annual leadership conference. Uh, it's for church workers. It's not just for pastors. It's for Sunday school teachers, bus workers, nursery workers, music people, uh, uh, whatever, if you're in Christian education, uh, youth ministry, uh, there's no charge for this. And they do a phenomenal job. They really do. It's well organized. Uh, you can come for any part of it that you want. If you have to work in the morning, you can shoot in and, and uh, be part of the afternoon or, or vice versa. Uh, let me encourage you. Uh, we've been taking groups to New Jersey to the Quad State. And I'm not saying we won't promote that, be a part of that. Uh, this is in our backyard. Uh, it's 20 minutes or so up the road. You don't have to travel far. And uh, let me encourage you, if you can, uh, to be a part of it. Uh, there's information out on the bulletin board as far as starting times and so forth. And uh, again, no cost. They do serve uh, a lunch. I think that it costs a few dollars uh, for that. And, and it's always uh, well done and, uh, and so forth. But uh, other than that, there's no charge for it. It's just you come and you learn and uh, you will be helped. I guarantee you that. Brother Rob. Uh, choir members will be having practice after the service this evening downstairs in the Filipino Chapel as we get ready for uh, the World Missions Revival this week and then uh, Easter coming up next month. And so please be there for that. Go downstairs right away, grab your books, and, uh, and as we get ready for those things. Then we do have one birthday to recognize tonight. It is Caleb Simmons' birthday on, Friday, on Thursday. I'm sorry, on Thursday. And was not able to be in the service this morning. Wanted to recognize it. Yes, I know he's very excited about it. He's turning 18, though, so something to be excited about. Yes, is there anybody else that has a birthday this coming week, though, somebody that we missed this morning or this evening? Nope, I thought we got all of them this morning. Let's sing happy birthday to Caleb. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And take your songbooks once more. Turn to number 191. 191. And let's stand once more. As we sing, count your blessings. <clears throat> Number 191. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, When you are discouraged thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, name them one by one, And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. On the last verse. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you till your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Blessings, see what God hath done. And you may be seated. Let's pray for our offering this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for being a part of a church that gives. God, it's such an encouraging thing to see week in and week out, Lord, your people give faithfully. I pray that we continue to give faithfully even now, that we give what you commanded us to. Bless this offering and the message to follow in your name. Amen.
right, grab your Bibles with me if you would and turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 also at this time. If you make sure your cell phones, other devices are on silent or vibrate, we appreciate that. 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 8 responsively uh, this evening. Once you found your place there, if you'd stand with me, out of respect for God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'll begin in verse number 1. The Bible says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith." Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And let's pray one more time this evening for the message. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. Once again, Father, thank you so much for being a part of church that loves your word. God, that loves to hear your word preached. God, I pray that we wouldn't take for granted the opportunity we have tonight to hear Pastor Bish preach. I pray that you'd fill him with your spirit now. I pray that we would hang on to every word tonight, and we wouldn't just hear, but we would do what you ask us to. pray this in your name. Amen.
and thank you. And that is a sobering truth, isn't it? To whom much is given, the Savior said, much shall be required. If your Bibles are open to 2 Timothy 4, a very uh, simple message tonight, but uh, very pointed, and I hope that you'll uh, let the Lord work in your heart. The Apostle Paul's in prison as he pens these words. As far as we know, when he sets his pen down after finishing chapter four, what we call chapter four, uh, this was the last letter that he would write. There were no other words of divine inspiration that God would use from his pen. For all intents and purposes, his ministry's done. He's in prison. There'll be no planting of churches taking place. He'll not go back and revisit the churches that he's planted. His, his ministry is done. Uh, he's all by himself. It doesn't seem like there's a stream of visitors coming in to see him to whom he's ministering. Uh, he, he does say that Luke is still with him and he's going to encourage Timothy to come as quickly as he possibly can. But please understand, the warrior's battle is over and he knows that. He says in verse number six, for I'm now ready to be offered in the time of my departure is at hand. There are some who believe that Paul may have already known when his death sentence was to be carried out. You know, here in our country, if there's to be an execution of a criminal, uh, there's a date that is set, and of course they do the appeals process and so forth, but then eventually that time comes. Some think that he may have already had the day set and he knew the time of my departure is at hand. So Paul's about to step off the scene, but he realized the work of God is not finished. There's still much to do. He is just, he just the first wave and there's got to be more churches planted and there's got to be more preachers going out and there's more people to be saved. And so first and second Timothy, I, I believe also Titus were written to encourage some young men saying, look, I, I'm about to pass off the scene. I'm going to hand you the baton. It's your time. You need to stand. That's why he tells Timothy, neglect not the gift that it was in thee. Stir that gift up. Uh, don't let fear overwhelm you. God's not given us the spirit of fear. He's encouraging Timothy saying, I'm about to leave. And son, you've got to step up and take your place. Son, if you don't do it, there's going to be this giant gap there and the work of God will not go forward. So that's why Paul tells Timothy in verse five, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Christian life is not supposed to always be easy. There are joyful moments and times when we rejoice and there are great fun days and, and things like that. Uh, but, but there's also hardness that's a part of the Christian life. Paul told Timothy uh, elsewhere, he said, endure hardness as a good soldier for Jesus Christ. Um, I think it was uh, uh, Lester Roloff used to say, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Uh, and we, we got this idea today that church and ministry is supposed to be, we just all come and have fun. Uh, let's all have some mood music and we we'll have some mood lighting and uh, we'll just, you know, dance and party our, our time away. That's not church. That's not the ministry. There's a warfare that's going on. There's, there's a warfare against the world and the flesh and the devil. And Paul tells Timothy, endure afflictions. Don't stop because it gets hard. Don't stop because it maybe gets dangerous. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Get that gospel message out. Make full proof of thy ministry because Timothy, I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure is at hand. So he's, he's about to close this last letter that he'll ever pen, this last letter to Timothy. And he's uh, made these statements. And now he's going to talk about some things to Timothy. He knows he's about to leave, but he's got some things that he's rejoicing in. I want you to notice, first of all, in verse number seven, he's going to talk about the cross. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, I know the word cross does not appear there. But we're talking about the, the concept that our Savior taught repeatedly. For example, in Luke 9, 23, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. A cross is a calling. It is a cause. It is a burden that the Lord places on us. And every one of us is supposed to have one. If you're going to follow Christ, by the way, if you're not bearing a cross, you're not following Christ. He said, you have to deny yourself, set your will aside, uh, take up your cross daily and follow me. 
And the apostle Paul talks about that here when he says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. He talks about a cross. Again, that, that cross is a calling. It is a cause. It is a burden. For some, the cross is to pastor a church. For some, it's to serve as a youth pastor. For some, it's to serve in, in Sunday school or bus ministry or junior church, uh, Christian education, um, uh, whatever it is. Everybody has something God has uh, planned for us. He's given us those spiritual gifts that we use them in, in carrying the cross for his glory. Sometimes the cross is not about a ministry per se, but sometimes it truly is affliction. It is a burden uh, that, you, that you bear for God's glory. We've had a couple such individuals come through. Evangelist John Bishop, uh, who had spinal meningitis and two months later woke up with absolutely no memory of anything in his past life. And even to this day, he has no memory of, the, uh, of anything prior to the day he woke up. The only thing he knew is that he was saved. And that's a miracle of God that he knew that he had to learn to talk. His wife had to teach him uh, to feed himself, to dress himself and all of those things. And his trials went on and on and on and on. And yet God used him as he came to churches like ours. He was here more than once just talking about those things and teaching us that God is always good. God is good all the time. Kirby Campbell and the physical afflictions that he, that he endured caused the birth of a ministry like Treasure Trial Ministries to crisscross the country, helping people go through burdens. And sometimes God does lay that on people. And that is their cross that they've got to bear, some physical affliction. But Paul talks about it. Now, I want you to understand, he is not lamenting his cross. He's not saying, man, it's been rough. Man, I've been shipwrecked and beaten with rods and stoned and all that. That's not what he's saying here. He is at the end of his race and, and he's actually exulting about the whole thing. He said, I have fought a good fight. Again, we come to that idea, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I didn't lay down my sword. I didn't lay down my weapon. I didn't quit when the going got tough. He said, I fought a good fight. Sometimes I had to just plug on through all of the hardships. Sometimes it was more difficult. He said, we, in, in one place in the Bible, he said, we are pressed out of measure. He said, sometimes we don't even know if there's enough of us to carry us through. And yet he said, we keep on going and God's grace is sufficient. He said, I fought a good fight. I fought faithfully. I fought obediently. He said, I've finished my course. He said, God had a plan for my life and I stayed true to it. I didn't veer to the right. I didn't veer to the left. I didn't decide somewhere along the line that maybe I had a better plan than God. He said, I have finished my course. I have stayed true to my calling. Uh, Paul didn't uh, just start out serving God. He said, I've stayed faithful and I'm here in the last days of my life and I can happily say I've finished my course. I'm finishing well. He said, I have kept the faith. By that he means I have stayed true to the faith that is established for us in the word of God. He said, I stay true to the doctrines of the word of God. I didn't allow culture to dictate what I believe. I didn't allow, allow society or other people to sway me away from these truths. I found out what God said and I've stayed true to that. It hasn't been popular. He said, it's made me a lot of enemies, but I have kept the faith. I have not only preached the faith. He said, I've lived the faith. Look at chapter three, if you would, please. Paul says in verse number 10, he says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. That's the place he got stoned. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. It's almost as if in Paul's life, that God allowed the devil to throw everything at one man, one preacher that he could to say to the rest of us as Christians, if he can get through that by my strength, you can get through anything you're going through. Paul endured all of that. And he says, I, he could say triumphantly, I have kept the faith. There's, there's something about finishing the race isn't there. There's something about that. There's a joy about that. My son's running video. He's absolutely going to love this. About a year ago, we decided we were going to have a, a, a team together to run the Gaylord Gauntlet, the 5K obstacle run over at Gaylord Hospital. 
And uh, I was already uh, going to be running that. We thought I was going to run with the Hanger Clinic, but everybody on their team got injured and dropped out. So we started our own. Well, Tim decided he's going to run. Uh, you know, he's going to support his old dad and all that kind of stuff. And uh, then he went out and ran and found out, you know, you know, he, he ran from the house to the car and he was winded. And he, he just thought, man, I've got a lot of work to do. So he started working and he really did. But all I heard for weeks and weeks, man, I hate running. I hate running. Oh, my legs are sore. I hate running. Somewhere along the line, Pastor John Barnes, we know him fairly well, uh, talked him into running the, the uh, half marathon portion of the Hartford Marathon. That's what, 13 and a half miles? Some 13 and a half miles. I'll drive 13 and a half miles, but running it? But he, he paid the 90 or 100 bucks to register for the Hartford Marathon and thought, well, I can't really waste that money now. So uh, brother, brother Barnes got him hooked up with some apps or something like that and showed him how many miles he had to run to, to be in condition to run a half marathon. It was hundreds and hundreds of miles he had to run. So he's out in all kinds of weather. Of course, he's training in June, July, August, and September, the hottest months of the year and all that kind of stuff. And man, I heard all this whiner baby stuff come. It was so hot and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, I kept hearing this phrase, I'm never doing this again. I'm never doing this again. I'm doing it because I told Brother Barnes I would. I paid the money. I don't want to waste it. I'm never doing this again. Do you remember saying those words to me? Every day. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was something. And, and by the way, he, he had some good days. Every now and then I'd get a text and call, Dad, you're never going to guess what. I just ran five miles without stopping. And I, I, I always wanted to say something positive. About it, but every now and then I would say, hey, guess what? I drove five miles without stopping. Yeah, just rub it in. That, uh, but uh, he, would, he was doing good and he was increasing how, how long he could run and the distance. And, you know, he's trying to pick up his pace and all that and, and so forth. Uh, and it was hard and, and uh, it was difficult and he had a lot to complain about, but he stayed at it. The day of the marathon, it was cold and rainy. It was like, like the middle of October, a cold, rainy Saturday. Uh, so I went up with him. I was still on crutches. I didn't have Lazarus yet. And uh, so I went up there and, and into Hartford. Uh, he wanted me to drive because I got handicapped parking. We didn't have to walk as far. And... Uh, uh, so I went over, we found Brother Barn over, Barnes over by the, the starting line and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, they, they, uh, th those bibs that they wear with their numbers, they somehow have a chip or something in them. And I got an, uh, put the app on my phone uh, so where I could monitor his progress and show me exactly where in the course he was and about when he was expected to be done and so forth. So uh, I watched them all get started and take off. And I went back to my car with my Dunkin' Donuts and uh, turned the heater on. Uh, read my Bible, took a nap, kept checking the app and stuff like that. And I wanted to be at the finish line when, when Tim got there. I remember this guy that's been complaining for like months and months and months, I'm never doing this again. And I did, I got to be there. Some lady with an umbrella was just poking everybody in the eye. I wanted to just throw her in a mud puddle, but I was good. But I managed, the guy on crutches is squeezing around this stupid woman with an umbrella uh, that was just, uh, yeah. Anyhow, uh, another sermon entirely. And there he came, and I, I got a little video of Tim going across the finish line. And then I had to make my way through the crowd and get there was a part of the course he still had to finish up as a kind of a cool down area, and they had a medal to put around him and so forth. And so he came, and you know he was wet and uh, all that. They had one of those astronaut blankets to put around him and stuff like that. And the first words out of his mouth after all of that complaining was, "That was awesome. That was awesome." And he just tell me, I'm thinking, you said you're never going to do this again. He's, he's talking about running the whole marathon this year. Am I right? What? Two years. He's going to run the, the full marathon. Do you realize how much whining I'm going to listen to for the next <laughs> two years? But, but listen very carefully. The point of the matter is there was a lot of things to work through for Brother Tim as he, as he prepared to run his first half marathon. A lot of hot days, a lot of days where he didn't feel well. I think he suffered some shin splints along the way and, and all those kind of things and a lot of sore, achy muscles and, and a lot of long runs and all that. But there was something about crossing that finish line. There was, in, in his mind, there was something about just seeing the finish line knowing, holy cow, I'm finishing my first half marathon that just took all of the hardships and put them behind him 
to say it was worth it. Oh man, this was an awesome thing. Paul has, has dealt with all of those persecutions and he's talking about that cross, not in a negative way saying, look, I, it was a fight, but I fought a good fight. And it was a long road, but I finished my course. I didn't go sit out. I didn't stop. I, I, I didn't wimp out along the way. He said, and I've kept the faith. I've stayed true to the word of God, no matter what anybody thought, no matter what anybody said. And Paul talks about that cross. Beloved, we got to understand there's a cross that we are called to bear. There's a course that God has for us. It is our day to stand up and fight the good fight of faith. And it's up to us to keep this faith, to hold it pure, to hold the word of God high, not to change it, not to compromise on it. It's our job. We have a cross to bear. But Paul didn't stop with the cross with Timothy. He went straight from the cross to the crown. Verse number eight, henceforth. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. There was a crown. There was a crown. Paul said, because I fought a good fight, because I've carried my cross, there's a crown waiting on me. There's a crown waiting on me. The Bible speaks of those in several different places, but Paul was looking for that. By the way, may I put in, in, in or interject at this point, nowhere in scripture do I see that in heaven there will be participation trophies. We live in such a stupid world that everybody's a winner. We don't keep score. Everybody gets a trophy. And they're too dumb to believe, to understand that every kid out there knows exactly how many goals they scored. And they know exactly who won the game or not. And those kids are saying, we won, but everybody got a trophy. You don't see that in the Bible. What you see in the Bible, look at the parable of the talents. Um, the, the man with five talents who made five more, he got rewarded. The man with two talents who made two talents more, he got rewarded. The guy with one talent who did nothing with it, he didn't get rewarded. He got, he got judged. You, you do understand that. Um, everybody wants the trophy. Everybody wants the crown. But understand, Paul said that that crown is laid up not just for him, but for all those that love his appearing. Before the crown, there is always a cross. You don't bear the cross. You forfeit the crown. You forfeit the crown, even our Savior. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Paul's looking forward to that crown. Paul has run his, his race the way that he should, and he's, he's, he's excited about it. Uh, and he knows that God is a faithful judge. He knows God is going to keep his word. He doesn't feel like he's wasted his life. He doesn't feel like he's wasted a moment of that life, even though it didn't end up where he thought it might the day he started following Christ. He knows that was God's course. And he's looking forward to that crown. And that crown is not just for one man, an apostle from the first century, he said, but unto all them also that love his appearing. What does it mean to love his appearing? Let me sort of illustrate it this way. When I was a kid one day, uh, one afternoon in the summer, I was out in the front yard and I had found some matches. And it wasn't a real good plan of mine, but I was playing with mass matches in the front yard and I set the front yard on fire. It was very, very dry summer. I was kind of dumb to do this, and I set the front yard on fire, and there's just enough of a breeze that it was just spreading out, and uh, I, I wasn't stomping it out fast enough. And I thought, I'm going to burn my house down. I'm going to burn these trees down. I'm going to jail the whole nine yards. My mom happened to look out the window. She's in the kitchen. She just happened to look out, and she saw me, you know, doing my little dance in the front yard trying to get the fire out. And she must have had a basin of water or something in the sink. And the next thing I know, she came out flying out the front door and threw water on it, and, and we got it all out. And uh, I don't remember the lecture that I got. I know that I got when my mom was outstanding at those kind of things. And, you know, you could have burned the house down. What were you thinking? And, you know, all that. What I really remember were the last words that she said. I'm going to give you the first word. You're going to finish the phrase. Wait. Wait till your father gets home. We lived in a farmhouse. 
And uh, running uh, in, in front of our farmhouse, there was a, a driveway, a, a dirt road, then there was a, a, a small cornfield, and then there, there was Route 66 uh, that ran in front of it. Uh, Dad was always coming up north on Route 66, and at the top of the hill, he'd make a real sharp turn into that dirt driveway and come down the hill to our house. So we would sit on the front porch and the steps. Uh, we knew dad was usually coming by 4.30, 5 o'clock, so we would be there. And uh, we'd see that, that Dodge Gray pickup, 1963 pickup going up there. And we'd go tearing off the front porch and across the yard and up the hill uh, because uh, the first person that got there always got to sit in dad's lap and drive the rest of the way. You know what that meant. Uh, we just sat in his lap and, you know, we couldn't reach the pedals anyhow. The rest of us, we piled in the back. Anybody ride in the back of a pickup? and no DCF there to turn you in or anything like that. And that was kind of a daily thing, Monday through Friday. Uh, that, uh, that evening when dad came home, I wasn't sitting on the front porch. I really wasn't looking forward to dad coming home. Uh, I don't know what I was doing. I was probably trying to look industrious, like weeding in the garden or you know working really hard uh, because I didn't want to see him because mom had said, wait. I did not love my dad's appearing. Wait till your father gets home. And uh, so we, you know, everybody got around the dinner table. My mom didn't say a word. You know, we're, we're finally sitting down. We, we pray, you know, that type of thing for our food. And uh, we're just about to dig in. And mom says, Tommy, tell dad what you did today. Now, he's not interested. I wasn't a glad moment. You see, when you're not doing right, you're not looking forward to your father coming home. Those that love is appearing are those that are finishing their course. Those that are keeping the faith, those that are bearing the cross, they're the ones that are looking forward to Jesus coming again. Those are the ones that always have an eye toward heaven. And Paul said, I'm looking forward to that. He said, I've borne my cross. And he said, I'm so close to the finish line now. All the hardships seem like nothing. That's why in 2 Corinthians 4, he talked about his afflictions. He said, these light afflictions, which are but for a moment, they, he said, they earn for us a far more eternal and exceeding weight of glory. He's excited about the crown because he bore his cross, but it didn't stop at a crown. I want you to turn to second Thessalonians. I'm sorry. First Thessalonians chapter two, turn back a couple pages. There was not only a cross. There's not only a crown. There was a crowd. There was a crowd, something that Paul was looking forward to. You understand that when we receive our crowns in heaven, if we've, if we've done well, if we followed the leadership of Christ in our lives, those crowns the Lord places on us, we're not going to keep those. We're not going to keep those. So I understand my Bible is going to come a day in, in heaven where we're going to take those crowns off of our head and we're going to cast them at the feet of the Savior. You know that place where they sing, worthy is the lamb that was slain? Because we're going to understand I'm not worthy of anything. He's worthy of everything. You say, well, what's the point of getting a crown? Because on that day, I'm going to want to have something tangible to show my Savior how much I adore him. I don't want to be standing off to the side somewhere because I was one of those who was saved, yet so is by fire. I didn't win anybody to Christ. I didn't bring anybody to church. I didn't build a bus ride. I didn't build a Sunday school class. I didn't reach people for the Lord. I just kind of did my own thing and all of that. So I get to heaven and I'm saved, but there's really nothing eternal to show for what I did with my life. So I stand off the side, not only watching while the others receive their reward and I suffer loss or reward, but at that moment where everybody begins casting those crowns at the feet of the Savior, and I have nothing to put before him. Boy, I want to have a crown. I want to have a crown, not so I can walk around wearing a crown, so I have something to place at my Savior's feet. But there is something else that Paul looked forward to in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Some think this is another crown uh, that we could be presented in heaven. I don't believe it is. Uh, the context tells us that. He says, what's our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming for ye are our glory and joy. He said, you know what our crown's gonna be? Seeing you in heaven. He's writing to the church at Thessalonica. I think one of his two favorite churches. Uh, a, a church, he was only their pastor for a month. He won all of the founding members to Christ. 
possibly even the first pastor, ruler of the synagogue. Um, it's it, 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 it just, uh, he had this special relationship. He said, you know what our hope and joy and crown of rejoicing is? We're going to see you in heaven someday. It's the crowd. It's the crowd. It's the people that you led to Christ that's going to make it all worthwhile if you've led somebody to Christ. It's the people that you reached. It's the families that you reached. It's the visitors you brought to church who listened to the gospel message and got saved. Paul said our crown of rejoicing is not a golden thing set on our head. It's those people around us. Follow this. Follow this little line of history, if you would. We're, we're well acquainted with the name Billy Graham. Billy Graham started out as an independent Baptist. I don't know if you knew that. In the early 1960s, he decided to become ecumenical. Uh, I think he was a sincere man. Uh, he thought he could reach more people by crossing the lines and all that. By the way, you never change the wrong crowd. The wrong crowd always changes you. And sadly, by the end of his life, he, he was screwed up on his doctrine and he no longer believed in a hell and, and uh, believed that there were maybe more than one way to heaven. But while that man was faithful and true, untold numbers of people were won to Christ through his ministry, possibly millions, possibly millions. My mother told me that uh, when she was a girl, she went to a Billy Graham crusade. I'm sorry, when she was a young woman, uh, she went to a Billy Graham crusade back in the early, early days of his ministry, and that's where she got saved. And I thank the Lord for that. Billy Graham. Billy Graham was led to Christ by a converted Jew, a man by the name of Mordecai Ham, who got saved and, and God called him to preach. And uh, Mordecai Ham uh, became an evangelist. And it's not as familiar a name. If, if you've ever studied church history, uh, modern church history, you would come across the name Mordecai Ham. Uh, he preached a lot in the south uh, of our country, southeastern part. And Mordecai Ham led Billy Graham to Christ. Mordecai Ham was led to Christ by an evangelist named Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was big in the early 20th century. Billy Sunday, when he would come into a city, they would build a wooden tabernacle just for the purpose of him being there. Some of those tabernacles were so large they could see 10 to 20,000 people. He would come into a town, but he didn't stay. It wasn't a two or three uh, day meeting. He would sometimes stay for two or three months and he preached four to five, sometimes seven times every single day. Sometimes they would have just a ladies' meeting and Mrs. Sunday would, would speak to them. Uh, Billy Sunday was a fiery preacher. You can get some videos of him. Uh, Billy Sunday was a converted alcoholic who played baseball for the Chicago White Stockings. They call them the White Sox now. He was drunk and on his way to Lake Michigan to commit suicide one night, end his life. He was famous for being so fast at, 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 at stealing bases. People came just to watch him at it. But his life was a shambles, and he was just headed to Lake Michigan. He heard some singing, and he just happened to stumble into the Pacific Garden Mission and heard a gospel message and, 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 and so forth. Um, Billy Sunday was the guy who led Morde Mordecai Ham to Christ. Billy Sunday was, was largely responsible for our country adoption adopting uh, the uh, amendment to the Constitution banning alcohol. He hated drink. He hated alcohol because it, it nearly killed him uh, and so forth. Billy Sunday, that, more, that, uh, that Pacific Guard mission thing, Billy Sunday was reached and influenced by a man named J. Wilbur Chapman, who was traveling, who was preaching in Chicago at that time. Uh, J. Wilbur Chapman was also and evangelists. Now, we don't, we don't know a lot about him. He's not as famous as Billy Graham or Billy Sunday, but nonetheless, back in that day, in the late, teen, late 1800s, uh, J. Wilbur Chapman was a familiar name. That was back in the day when the uh, New York Times would run his sermons in, in, in their entirety in print. Now they just make fun of preachers, but then they would promote things like that. And Billy Sunday was a result of the ministry of J. Wilbur Chapman. J. Wilbur Chapman, as a young man, was influenced by the ministry of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was the most famous preacher on two continents in his lifetime. He traveled back and forth to England and, and Scotland and Ireland all the time. Uh, he built several schools 
uh, a revivalist. It is said that, that nearly two million people may have come to Christ during the ministry of D.L. Moody. Without internet, uh, without in, anything like that, God just used him in tremendous ways. D.L. Moody, he was led to Christ by Ed Kimball. Say, who's Ed Kimball? Sunday school teacher. A Sunday school teacher. Billy Graham was an evangelist, the famous man. Mordecai Ham, famous man, Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday, famous man, J. Wilbur Chapman. J. Wilbur Chapman, famous man, D.L. Moody, D.L. Moody, a Sunday school teacher. A Sunday school teacher who said, I'm not just there to fill in time. I'm not just there to show up exactly on time, meaning you're late, and just show up unprepared and just get through my 45 minutes and get those kids out of there. But a man who said, God's entrusted some young men into my care. And I need to make sure, first of all, that every one of those boys in my class knows Jesus Christ as Savior. And he chased those boys down everywhere he could around Boston until he made sure that he sat down one-on-one -on -one with every one of them and said, do you know for sure that you're saved? He found D.L. Moody as a 17-year-old working at his shoe store, his uncle's shoe store, and he sat down with him in the back where the stock room was and talked to this rough and tumble farm kid and talked to him about his soul. And Dwight Moody got saved. Ed Kimball was just burying his cross. He was finishing his course. He was keeping his faith. He was doing what God called him to do faithfully. He had no idea that multiplied millions of people were going to be saved over the next hundred or so years because he bore his cross and neither do you. Neither do you. In, the, in 1964, 1965, some bus workers from Troy Baptist Temple knocked on the door at 221 North 2nd Street in Tip City, Ohio. And they asked the lady who answered the door, they told them about the bus that they run and said, do you have anybody, the children that would like to ride our bus, we could take them to Sunday school. And the lady said yes and sent her four or five or six-year-old little girl to ride the bus to Troy Baptist Temple. The little girl rode the bus till she was 16, 17 years of age about time to get ready to go to college. They ran that bus route faithfully. Sunday school teachers taught her. A pastor taught her faithfully. During that time, she got saved. During that time, they took her as a teenager to the Bill Rice Ranch in Tennessee. There she surrendered her life to serve the Lord with her life. She went off to Bible college. She met a young man there. She met a lot of young men there, but she met one that stuck in her mind. And uh, he graduated and moved on. But a few years later, she married me. Those bus workers, from the time we got married, Trina talked about them. She talked about her early Sunday school teachers. She talked about Pastor Duff all the time, all the time. And as far as she knew, those original bus workers were in heaven by the time we got married in the 1980s. It was 20 plus years later. Do you understand on December the 9th, 2017, when Trina stepped into the gate of heaven, there were some bus workers standing there. There's our crown. Can you imagine what that kind of reunion is like? Pastor Duff, who ministered to her for so many years, and she spoke so highly of this man. I never met him. I never had the privilege to do so. He's already in heaven before I knew her. But she talked about this godly man who taught her the Bible so faithfully. He walked, as she walked into heaven, Trina, you're my crown of rejoicing. Hey, child of God, are you going to have anybody in heaven there besides you? There are people in this room been saved for years, and you've never led a single person to Jesus Christ. Why? Oh, I didn't know I was supposed to. Not if you've been in this church for any length of time. Is there going to be anybody there besides you? A crown of rejoicing. There's some people there that I'm sure Trina made their day just walking into heaven because they could say, who would have guessed that that little girl was going to grow up to be a preacher's wife? And all the people that she influenced, they have a whole big part of that. We're all going to heaven someday. Aren't you glad about that? How many are glad you're saved? Amen. Uh, by the way, that sounded like you're okay with being saved. How many are glad you're saved? That sounds like you're getting better about it. How many are glad you're saved? Yeah. Come on, we are not Episcopalians. 
It is all right to say things like that in church. My grandson talks out in church. So can you when the pastor asks you to say amen. I'm glad I'm going to heaven, but I'm glad it's that, that God has this promise of a crown. And I'm glad for this thing called a crowd. I want to, I want to be able to go to heaven and realize I didn't go all by myself. We ought to be trying to take as many people with us as possible. It is said on the night that the Titanic sank, we now know that they had far uh, too few lifeboats. They should have had, they, they should have had so many. They, even if every lifeboat was full, they didn't have enough lifeboat, lifeboats for the number of people on the ship. But when they lowered those lifeboats, each one of them, some of them, I think they could handle 60 people in them. When the USS Carpathia arrived the next morning to try to find survivors and they got those boats. Some of those lifeboats that could have handled 64 people had five or six people in them. They sailed by people that were crying in the water and they only survived in that water for a matter of a few minutes because of the cold, the hypothermia. Nobody survived very long, but they would not bring people in for fear that too many would swim and the boat would get capsized. So they were content just to sail on. We're safe. And they let the others drown. Is that the way we're going to go to heaven? Well, I'm safe. Good luck to you. Hope somebody tells you. We, we've, we've not, we've, we've got to make sure we don't allow that wicked mentality to be ours. There's somebody out there that needs you to tell them about Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I know it's, it's nerve wracking. I know sometimes it's inconvenient. I, I understand all that, but you're going to have to deny yourself. Get over yourself and realize they're perishing without Christ. You do that faithfully. I'm going to guarantee you when you're looking at the last day and you're realizing I'm a step from eternity to be able to look back and say, I finished my course. I've kept the faith. I fought a good fight. I bore the cross the Lord had for me. You're going to be saying it was hard at times, but I sure am glad I did. Because now there's a crown. Boy, I'm going to have something to cast at the feet of Christ. What an honor to do that for him. But then you get to look forward to the crowd. Look forward to the crowd. I wonder what Ed Kimball's crowd looks like. I wonder how many people have come up and shaken his hand saying, thank you for leading D.L. Moody to Christ. Oh, did he lead you to the Lord? No, but Billy Sunday did. J. Warbur Chapman did, or one of their converts did. The crowd. Father in heaven, would you help us? Help us to bear our cross faithfully. Help us not that, Lord, I know it's hard, but help us not see it as a bad thing, but as a wonderful opportunity to love our Savior. Help us, Lord, to bear our cross in such a way that we can be confident of a crown. And oh, Lord God in heaven, put something in our heart that says, I don't want to go to heaven by myself. I don't want to be one of those people in a lifeboat letting people drown because I'm safe and that's all that matters to me. May we be trying to get everybody into the gospel light, lifeboat that we can while there's still time. Lord, burden our church about this. Lord, I pray that tonight you'd use the message, encourage us to be faithful. With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, would you just stand to your feet? As you stand, may I ask you a question? How many say, Pastor, if I died this moment, I know for sure I'm going to heaven. I'm saved and I know it. Could you lift up your hand? I'm saved and I know it. All right, praise the Lord. That's wonderful. That looked like everybody. But if you're here tonight and you're not sure you're saved, you ought to come tonight and get that settled. Everybody just had your hand up. You're safe. You're going to heaven no matter what happens now. Please don't let that be your mentality. Well, I'm, I'm saved. That's all that matters. Somebody else needs that. Somebody you know. Somebody you go to school with. Somebody you work with. Somebody that you're going to cross paths with this week. They don't know how to be saved, but you do. Are you going to tell them? Or are you just going to sail on thinking, I'm good. I'm good. Bear your cross. There's a crown. 
But I think maybe better than the crown is the crowd. I don't want to go to heaven by myself, do you? If God spoke to your heart tonight, the pianist begins a song of invitation. Would you make your way to the front? Are you going to take anybody with you? Some, when I was a teenager and I first heard about soul winning, I, I didn't know what to do about it. But I'd hear people talking about it. every Wednesday night I'd go home and I'd just, I'd lay in my bed and I'd beg God to help me win somebody to the Lord the next day. We had teen soul or church soul, soul winning Thursday night and I was always there and, and uh, just weeks went by and I never, never got to do it. And I, it just became a passion, a, a burden on my heart. I couldn't escape. And I, I just started kind of crying myself to sleep at times. Lord, I, 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 why can't I lead somebody to Christ? And I remember the Thursday in the school library at Hempfield High School, I got to lead a friend of mine to Christ. I asked her the question, if you die today, do you know for sure to go to heaven? She said, no. And I had no idea what to do next. I was terrified. I'd never gotten that far. But I fumbled my way through the gospel. She understood it and I got to hear my first person pray and receive Christ as Savior, something I'll never forget. May God put a hunger in us. Lord, help me win somebody to the Lord. Help me win somebody to the Lord. Help me win somebody to the Lord. If you're a church member and you've been saved for a long time and have never yet won somebody to Christ, that needs to change. That ought not to be. That ought not to be. There's a cross to bear and there's a crown to wear. But there's a crowd, if you're faithful, that you're going to look around and say, that's my crown of rejoicing. Father, thank you for the testimony of Paul. Thank you for a man who endured so much for the kingdom of God. He just kept going. And Lord, I'm sure there were times that he got discouraged. I'm sure there were times he was heartbroken. In fact, in the last few verses of Timothy, he talks about some sadness in his life. But he didn't let that stop him. He got tired, got hungry. He was beaten. We know he had a thorn in the flesh. He had a physical affliction on top of all of that. But he finished well. And he could look back, say, I've finished my course. God, would you help me finish like that? Help me not to get discouraged or distracted just to finish well. Lord, I pray that this week, as the World Missions Revival starts, that we'll get involved in that. We'll put our hearts into that. We'll just purpose in our hearts we're going to be here every night because this is part of our course. This is part of the call that you've given to our church. I believe to all believers to get the gospel into all the world. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. Lord, I pray that you put a hedge about our church this week. The devil always has a way of fighting around missions conference time. Lord, would you keep our missionaries safe as they travel? Brother Morrison safe and healthy. Our people, just heal us of all the various things that are going on right now. Lord, I pray that the devil would not have an opportunity to cause any strife or discord. Lord, I pray you'd prepare our hearts on Wednesday night. Lord, I pray this place would be just... Uh, supercharged with the power of the Holy Spirit. We know God's doing something from the moment we walk in. Lord, we're going to take an offering to show some love to the men and women and families that are going to be with us this week. And Lord, I thank you always for the kindness of the people in this room, this church. And Lord, may we uh, be faithful and bless this offering tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you be seated just for a moment uh, as our ushers come? Thank you for those that gave this morning. Uh, for the special offering. Everything in this is going for the missionaries, just the families that are going to be with us. You can go ahead. And I, I've already prayed. This is just for the families that are going to be with us this week. Brother Morrison, uh, we've got Nick White and his wife. They're expecting their first baby. They're going to be here with us Wednesday with Barry Tinkson and his family. Uh, they are headed to Australia. I believe they've got five children. Uh, we've got uh, James Mills is going to be with us. Uh, his wife's not able to make the trip. And then we've got Ian Brown and his family going to be with us uh, Friday and Saturday. And uh, we want to be good to these servants of the Lord. And so let's be faithful in that. As soon as the offering's done, we're going to dismiss choir. You need to head downstairs. I, our choir is putting together some great music for us. And we have a great choir. And I'm looking forward to that on Wednesday night, opening things up. Uh, so choir, you'll head downstairs to meet with Brother Rob and get that practice going. Those who can, we need to tear down the auditorium. Last night uh, for our intramural volleyball 
And so if you can stay and help us with that, make sure you come by Crystal Petronico's here. You're here all week, right? She's in town all week. Uh, But uh, make sure you fellowship with her for a little bit. Let's stand. Brother Rob from the back, close us in prayer real fast.